Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome back to Virtual Hilltop, back to Virtual Dallas Hall. It's wonderful to see you. My name is Jeffrey Engel, and I'm the director of the Center for Presidential History. And this is part of our ongoing webinar series on history, American history, presidential history, all kinds of history that we're going to be exploring during this virtual semester. Uh, I am particularly pleased and thrilled to be able to bring you this discussion tonight uh, because it's a partnership not just with the Center for Presidential History, but also with our good friends from the Clement Center for Southwest Studies. I'm gonna be introducing uh, Andy Graybill, the director in just a moment to kick things off, but I'm here to do a little bit of uh, logistical work, if you will, housekeeping. Uh, we wanna have this be as interactive as possible. Uh, we wanna hear what you have to say, and more importantly, we want our guests to be able to hear the questions that you have to answer. So if you all wouldn't mind looking down right now at the bottom of your Zoom screen, You'll see a little place that says Q&A. In fact, somebody has already entered a question. I appreciate that. A little place that says Q&A. And you can click on that and enter in your question. But in addition to that, I would encourage you to keep that open, if you will, while you're listening to the presentation. Because as other people's questions come in, you have the ability to like them. Uh, it's a very liking society we've developed. You have the ability to like them, which kind of shoots them up the, the chart, if you will, up the queue. So the more people that look at a question and say, yes, that's one I'd like to hear too, the more likely it is to be asked. So please participate either with your own question or with passing judgment on other people's. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, we're going to now uh, turn things over to Professor Andy Graybill, who is the director of the Clements Center for Southwest Studies and also a professor in the Clements Department of History. Uh, and you will see that he has a very ominous background. Uh, that's not actually what the sky looks like over Dallas Hall right now, but perhaps it's the way the sky should look like whenever Professor Graville is lecturing. Andy, floor is yours. Thanks, Jeff. My office is too messy to uh, not have some sort of a green screen up. Um, always a pleasure to part with our, with our pals at the Center for Presidential History. Uh, let me thank also Brian Franklin for running things logistically so smoothly. Uh, and also a shout out to Ruth Ann Elmore, who was the Clement Center's assistant director, who helped coordinate things uh, on our side of the event tonight. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you Professor Greg Cantrell, the Ralph and Irma Lowe Chair in Texas History at TCU. Greg, the native son of Abilene, as you will hear in just a moment, and a Texas Aggie through and through. He earned two degrees in business at College Station before he decided to chase the big payday by studying for his history PhD. He taught first at Sam Houston State University, then at Hardin-Simmons, and after that at the University of North Texas before moving to the lesser side of the DFW area Metroplex in 2003. Greg, of course, would demur. He's told me on more than one occasion that life is too short to live in Dallas. But be that as it may, Dallas has been good to Greg and vice versa. When the Clement Center opened its doors in the fall of 1996, Greg was one of our first two fellows. Nancy Beck Young, another terrific historian of Texas, whom I believe may be somewhere out there in the webinar audience tonight, perhaps even with her students, was the other. It was a great first class. It was here at SMU where Greg finished his second book, Stephen F. Austin, Empresario of Texas, published by Yale in 1998. This is the first scholarly biography of the so-called father of Texas in more than seven decades. The book won a slew of major prizes and its success was a boon to the reputation of the fledgling Clement Center, a debt we owe Greg even still. Greg's a specialist in the history of Texas, the American South and the US West, with a particular focus on politics and society. Such interest and expertise inform his latest book, The People's Revolt, which he will discuss with us this evening. Greg is a past president of the Texas State Historical Association, although I suspect that is an honor he would have traded for just one World Series ring for his beloved Texas Rangers baseball club, whose radio broadcast drew his rapt attention when he was a teenager out there on the plains. And while it may be cliche to use the term, Greg is a true Renaissance man a concert pianist, as well as an extraordinary craftsman. The home renovations he undertook this spring and summer are something to behold. He's entertained all of his Facebook friends with rather extraordinary pictures of garage doors fixed, dormers dealt with, kitchens renovated, and so on. So please join me in welcoming Greg Cantrell. 
Thanks so much, Andy and Jeff. Um, I want to thank the SMU Center for Presidential History and the Clement Center for Southwest Studies for giving me this opportunity to share my work. And most of all, I want to thank all of you for tuning in. I know that uh, certainly for those of us in academia that, that we're all suffering from Zoom fatigue these days, and it really means a lot to me uh, to know that you would voluntarily uh, spend another hour of your time with your eyeballs glued to a glowing glass tube. The title of my presentation tonight comes from my new book, The People's Revolt, Texas Populists and the Roots of American Liberalism. And I want to begin by posing a question. What do all of the following political figures have in common? Huey Long, Joseph McCarthy, George Wallace, Ross Perot, Howard Dean, Sarah Palin, Hugo Chavez of Venezuela, Marine Le Pen of France, Victor Orban of Hungary, and Jair Bolsonaro of Brazil? Of course, the answer is they have all been described as populists. Now, a quick Google search this week for the word populism returned nearly 25 million hits. And by the way, this is more than double the number uh, that I got when I did this same Google search back in 2016. Clearly the term, which dates to the 1890s, is still very much with us today. And I'll just pull up a few examples from fairly recent uh, American history to illustrate this. Uh, Obama hones populist message in Nevada. Biden stokes working class populism. That was from the 2012 campaign. Paul Ryan, a populist? Hmm. Mitt Romney? Really? Now, this might suggest to us that the term has been so overused as to be practically meaningless. At the very least, it must be a very malleable term to be applicable to such a broad array of public figures. So what is populism? What does it mean to say someone is a populist or that he or she made a populist appeal to some audience? Well, here's my handy dandy four part definition. First, populism as we understand it today is not really an ideology, but rather it's, it's a way that people make political arguments. Uh, it's a persuasion uh, in which people, in, in which politicians speak, try to speak the language of the common people. Secondly, populists champion uh, the rights and causes of ordinary people against the actions and interests of hostile elites. Third, populists challenge not the foundations or structure of the government, but rather the, the hijacking of government by selfish interests, usually moneyed interests. And finally, as a form of political speech or political persuasion, populism can be employed by either the right of the political spectrum or the left, and for good or for ill. So with this definition, we can see how we end up with this Still somewat confounding story I found from the Vassar College student newspaper in which we see uh, Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump both portrayed as populists. Uh, and, and, I, and I like this one because it's this Venn diagram. If you look closely, you'll see that the, the intersection part of the, the Venn diagram is, is populism. So two very different political messages, but sharing this, I, I think, really all of the, the elements of, of a populist appeal that I outlined in my, in my definition. Now, this still begs the question, of course, where does populism come from? Now, appeals to working men and against Washington elites go back at least as far as Andrew Jackson. But having said that, the roots of American populism, and, and the, certainly the term itself, really originates, surprisingly enough, here in Texas in the decades following the Civil War. Cut to Lampasas, Texas, 170 miles southwest of where I'm sitting tonight in Fort Worth. 
It's the year 1877 and a group of small farmers that or have organized the first chapter of the Texas Farmers Alliance. It was designed to be a self-help organization aimed at addressing the dire agricultural depression that had settled over the nation. The alliance grew slowly at first, but then in the mid 1880s, it, it spread like wildfire, eventually enlisting hundreds of thousands of members nationwide. The centerpiece of its program was the establishment of cooperatives, that is member owned stores and gins and, and, and grain mills and, and especially cooperative crop marketing arrangements. And I, I've got a, a map here uh, from my book that shows the extent and variety of cooperatives in Texas, local cooperatives in Texas. And these are just the ones that I could find. The Alliance's crowning achievement was the creation in 1887 of a statewide Alliance Exchange. The exchange was the brainchild of the State Alliance President Charles W. McCune, a Wisconsin born medical doctor and lawyer and, and uh, journalist, talk about a, a Renaissance man. And with the exchange, McCune promised to collectively market the cotton crop of the entire 100,000 plus Alliance members in Texas, and to do bulk purchases at wholesale prices uh, of equipment and supplies for members. The exchange built a state-of-the-art headquarters and warehouse in downtown Dallas. And amid much fanfare, Texas farmers trumpeted their impending liberation from the ruthless merchants, cotton buyers, and other middlemen who they believed were robbing them of their hard-earned profits. But their elation was short-lived. The exchange itself needed credit to operate, and, and bankers and merchants refused to extend that credit. Before the end of its second year, the alliance had collapsed, bringing with down with it many of the local cooperatives. So the Alliance stood at a sort of crossroads by 1890. Alliance folk had always talked po politics in their local and state meetings. And by the way, when I refer to them as Alliance folk, it's because men and women both were members and both participated actively in the affairs of the Alliance. So Alliance folk had always talked politics in, the, in their meetings, but officially the organization was non-political and non-partisan. In the finest American tradition, farmers had been taught and believed that they should help themselves, pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Now, that's what the Alliance was all about. And, and not to rely upon government to solve their problems. But Alliance folk had also learned from bitter experience that self-help had failed. Now, led again by McCune, the organization made a bold proposal. It called on the federal government to create something it called the sub-treasury plan. Under this plan, the federal government would build a network of warehouses throughout the agricultural portions of the nation where farmers at harvest time could store their staple crops, deposit their crops, using the crops as collateral for low interest government loans. 2% interest loans at a time when interest rates for farmers were often 40 or 50% annual interest. The loans would be paid to the farmers in paper money known as greenbacks, which would have the effect of taking the nation off the gold standard. Uh, farmers blame, rightly blamed the gold standard for the, the tight money and the skyrocketing interest rates that they paid. By putting the federal government in charge of money, it would also remove the country's financial system from the hands of self-interested private bankers. At the state level, the Alliance also called for the creation of a railroad commission to regulate the monopolistic rates charged by the railroads. Both of these ideas, the, the, the sub-treasury and the Alliance, flew in the face of Texans' professed love of the free market. Now, Alliance folk hoped that the Democrats and or the Republicans would take up their cause. 
but they were doomed to disappointment. In Austin, Democratic Governor Jim Hogg did create a railroad commission, but it was weak and was soon uh, ruled to be unconstitutional. As for the sub-treasury plan, well, the, the cries of the leaders from both parties were about what you would expect. Socialism, communism, it's un-American, so forth. Faced with this rejection of their program by the major parties, the Alliance finally joined with the nation's leader, le leading labor union, the Knights of Labor, and other reform groups, and created their own new party, the People's Party. Its supporters were soon dubbed populists, and populists embraced the label. By 1892, populists had hammered out a, a platform calling for sweeping reforms. Populists demanded, quote, a national currency, safe, sound, and flexible, issued by the general government, unquote. In, in other words, the greenback system, which would take the country off the gold standard. They endorsed the sub-treasury plan. The platform called for a graduated income tax, which would place more of the nation's tax burden on the wealthy. Going a step beyond the idea of just regulating the railroads, populists called for government ownership of the roads, arguing that railroads were essentially public utilities used and needed by all. Likewise, they called for government ownership of the telephone and telegraph systems, which by their very nature tended to be monopolistic. In hopes of curbing political corruption, populists called for the direct election of U.S. senators by popular vote rather than being elected by state legislatures as they were done and to create a more level playing field for industrial workers, they demanded collective bargaining rights for organized labor. Texans played a prominent role in fashioning these demands, but in the meantime, they also had a state level party to build. Now this wasn't as simple as it might sound. At the state party's founding convention in Dallas in 1891, delegates immediately confronted the single most fraught issue that they would face. What would be the party's approach toward African Americans? Though we tend to think of the post-Reconstruction era as a time when Blacks were stripped of political power and the structures of the Jim Crow system were being constructed, Black Texans still voted in very large numbers in the 1890s. Their votes mattered. The chair of that first state convention, Harrison Sterling Price Ashby, better known by his nickname Stump Ashby, tackled the issue head on, declaring to the mostly white delegates there, although there were some blacks, that quote, African Americans are in the ditch just like we are. We want to do good to every citizen of the country and he is a citizen just as much as we are, and the party that acts on that fact will gain the colored vote of the South." Unquote. The delegates then went on to elect two African Americans to the party state executive committee, and Blacks had representation on the party's governing body for the remainder of the People's Revolt. By 1894, John B. Rayner, the son of a slave mother and a white U.S. congressman father, had become one of the party's most famous orators and organizers, working virtually full-time for the populist cause. The populists brought a number of rather unforgettable personalities into political prominence in Texas. Their nominee for governor in 1892 and 1894 was Thomas L. Nugent, a soft-spoken former judge from Fort Worth. Nugent's private life and, and public record were so spotless that even his opponents could find nothing to criticize about him personally, apart from his Swedenborgian religious faith and the fact that he was sympathetic to women's rights. And if you think about it, the, the fact that, that he held unconventional, unorthodox religious beliefs and advanced views on gender suggests that even if the rank and file of populist voters maybe didn't share all of those opinions, they were open-minded enough 
to not let it be a disqualifier for their most important leader. After Nugent's death in 1895, leadership fell to Dallas attorney Jerome Kirby, longtime veteran of independent politics who had almost certainly been cheated out of a congressional seat in the 1894 elections in the Dallas district. He, he lost by 200 votes out of 40,000 cast amid rampant charges of, of, uh, of vote buying and stealing. Kirby was a hero to organized labor and had a devoted following among Dallas's African-American community. As a lawyer, he had argued cases before the U.S. Supreme Court, and his keen intellect and, and oratorical skills made him a formidable campaigner. Also worth mentioning is Colorado County plantation owner Betty Gay who was one of several very prominent female populists. Uh, Gay played a very high profile role in both Alliance and People's Party affairs, fiercely advocating for women's rights in the pages of party newspapers and uh, taking a very active part in local and state populist conventions. Populists approach to women's issues contrasted very sharply with that of the major parties. Throughout the state, prominent architects, inventors, journalists, doctors, educators joined with ordinary farmers and laborers in taking up the cause of reform. How did their principal opponents, the Democrats, respond? Well, naturally, by branding them socialists, communists, and anarchists, but also somewhat incongruously, also at the same time, calling them hicks and hillbillies, or, or to use the vernacular of the day, hayseeds and calamity howlers. And this, this stereotype of the, of the populist hayseed became sort of entrenched in the, in the public mind. How would populists have actually governed if they had ever come into power in the state? Well, we get a glimpse by looking at the 1895 state legislature which included 24 populists. Now they were greatly outnumbered by Democrats, so they couldn't pass any legislation on their own, but the bills they sponsored speak loudly about their priorities. Not surprisingly, much of their legislation addressed economic issues, such as regulating the railroads and other monopolies. They supported numerous labor reforms, such as the eight hour workday, they sought to reform the, the convict lease system under which the state leased out state prison inmates, who of course were disproportionately people of color, uh, to, to private industry where of course the inmates were brutally exploited. They introduced bills to combat the rampant corruption in Texas county governments. They advocated for consumer protection legislation, such as bills requiring periodic audits of savings and loans. They sought to safeguard public health and safety by imposing speed limits on trains at road intersections or prohibiting the sale of cigarettes to minors. They tried to increase funding for public education, uh, improve teacher education, and provide better, better textbooks at lower cost. In a bill of tremendous importance to African Americans, they called for equal per capita funding for black schools and white schools and the placing of black schools under the control of black trustees. And finally, they advocated for a set of far reaching political forms, uh, reforms, imposing stiff fines and even prison sentences for perpetrators of election fraud. They steadfastly voted against the imposition of poll tax, a poll tax as a requirement for voting, even though Democrats introduced such bills in every single session. All of these measures, I argue, mark Texas populists uh, as pioneers of the political ideology, which in the 20th century we would come to call liberalism a term that was not generally applied to politics in the 1890s. What do I mean when I apply this label to them? Well, 
put most simply, I mean that they, they believe that in a democracy, the people can and should use their votes to ensure that neither government nor business corruptly abuse their power to the detriment of the people. Populists were no fans of big government for the sake of big government. In fact, many of their political reforms were aimed at, at limiting the powers that politicians could use that, that might restrict the ability of individuals to live lives of dignity and security. Nor were they opponents of capitalism as their opponents at the time and some modern historians have suggested. In 1894, if you don't believe me, ask Thomas Nugent. In 1894, Nugent exclaimed that, quote, capital is the handmaid of labor and the dispenser of blessings to all classes and conditions of humanity. Without capital, schools and universities would vanish, churches cease to exist, and organized charities pass away. Taste, culture, and refinement would wither and die as if stricken with a curse. Art and science would disappear forever. Unquote. Clear, clearly not an enemy of capitalism, but Nugent recognized that the modern corporation was itself a product of the state, enjoying special privileges such as limited liability for stockholders. As Nugent succinctly put it in one speech, quote, we are not fighting corporations, we are fighting monopoly, unquote. But populists understood that the only real counterbalance to the power of the modern corporation was the power of the government democratically wielded by the voters. Uh, running for Congress in his West Texas district in 1894, Brownwood, Texas populist Charles Jenkins declared, one of my favorite quotes from the period, I have never been frightened by that scarecrow strong government. I believe in a government strong enough to protect the lives, liberty, and property of its citizens." Unquote. Populists repeatedly pointed to the example of the Postal Service, that sound familiar? As an example of how government power could be used to promote the social good. Although the post office operated at a deficit then as it does now, most Americans in the 1890s loved it. It was a rural, we were a rural country and, and, and the postal service was the lifeline of isolated rural people. And populists viewed it as did most Americans as a necessary public utility. But to populists, the arrival of the modern industrial age simply meant that with the growth in concentrated corporate power, public power needed to be wielded in ways that went beyond just the social, just the postal service. As Stump Ashby cogently explained it, quote, with the progress of invention, with machinery destroying the trades and transferring labor to congested urban centers, with the locomotive displacing the ox cart and electric telegraphy destroying distance and communication, collusion has become the life of trade and in fact of all political economy. Things have so changed that the principles of government which were best adopted a century ago could not possibly be suitable today." Unquote. This very modern vision was not destined to prevail, at least not yet. To succeed in our two-party system, the People's Party would need to replace one of the major parties. That's just the way our system works. In 1896, populists thought this was on the verge of happening. They thought they would replace the Democrats as, as the second major party, along with Republicans. Both of the major parties, of course, had repudiated the populists' demands. The economy now hovered on the brink of collapse. But when the Democratic National Convention met in Chicago, the unexpected took place. A young congressman named William Jennings Bryan, who had endorsed several populist platform planks, but mostly minor ones, unexpectedly gained his party's nomination. When the Populist National Convention met two weeks later, to the great 
anguish of the 103 Texas delegates, the populists themselves endorsed the Democrat, Bryan. Bryan went on to lose to Republican William McKinley and the People's Party having surrendered its independent identity collapsed. Over the next century, as if to add insult to injury, people began to associate the populist label with demagogic appeals to the fears and prejudices of the masses, a fact that would have horrified the original populists. The old saying about history being written by the winners was never more true. Yet populist ideas survived, even if the label came to mean other things altogether. Some of those ideas found expression in the reforms of the progressive era. For example, the Federal Reserve System embodied much of the populist monetary policy platform. The direct election of US senators, the progressive income tax and woman suffrage were written into the constitution. Antitrust laws struck blows at corporate monopolies. Still more direct echoes of populist liberalism found expression in the New Deal. Federal farm programs reflected some of the ideas of the populists' sub-treasury plan. Uh, the Wagner Act for the first time gave labor unions meaningful power. The country effectively abandoned the gold standard. But the full legacy of populist liberalism wouldn't become apparent until the 1960s when a Texas born and raised president championed civil rights and voting rights for African Americans, declared a war on poverty, and marshaled the power of the federal government to create what he called the Great Society. When asked about the roots of his political beliefs, Lyndon Johnson recalled his childhood sitting on the front porch of his grandparents' farmhouse on the Perdinalis River listening to his grandfather, Sam Ely Johnson Sr., talk about his own experiences in the 1890s as a Farmers Alliance lecture, lecturer, a member of the Populist State Executive Committee, uh, and a populist candidate for the state legislature. LBJ recalled, quote, hearing my grandfather talk about the plight of the tenant farmer, the necessity for the worker to have protection for bargaining and the need for improvement of our transportation to get the farmer out of the mud." Unquote. In Lyndon Johnson's political world, populism had indeed cast a long shadow. Now, not every 20th century liberal could trace his political lineage as directly back to populism as LBJ could. But if you want to locate the roots of, a mod of modern American liberalism, the rocky soil of the Texas Hill Country isn't a bad place to start. Thank you. I think you're muted. There we go. Now that's much better. Now I don't look like such an idiot, just mouthing words that have no meaning uh, or no sound, I should say. Greg, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. It's really um, not only a fascinating Texas history, it's a fascinating addition to national political history. And of course, as we all know, most things that are important about the United States have some Texas connection. Uh, in fact, that's actually one of the questions I wanted to start with, um, which was offered by uh, Stephen, I'm sorry, Stephen, I think I might about to mess up your last name, Mazelis, Stephen Mazelis, uh, who want to know more specifically, why Texas? Why does this all happen in Texas? What is the, you know, could it have happened somewhere else, I guess is another way to, to put the story. Well, of course, populism wasn't restricted to Texas, obviously, it was a national movement. And it was, it was, it was strong in the, uh, in the, uh, Midwest in the in the the Mountain West especially, um, hard to say exactly why Texas ended up being so unique. Uh, I think most most scholars suggest that uh, Texas being still a, a, rel a relatively a frontier state, uh, 
and, and of course the the really the birthplace of the alliance was was out there in the cross in the western cross timbers right and in, in, out there in Lampasas and Brownwood and all you know that that area west of uh, west of the uh, of Fort Worth uh, which was still, which, which was just sort of emerging from its frontier state. So I think the idea maybe was that, that people who ventured out there were maybe a little less bound by tradition, right? Maybe a little more free thinkers in some ways. Certainly, certainly Sam Johnson, uh, Lyndon Johnson's grandfather fits this description. You know, he, you know, he ran cattle he, he was he, he was a he was a, a, a cattleman and ran you know, cattle herds up up the, the trail to Kansas uh, during the heyday of the great cattle drives. I mean, and, and took his wife with him on one of them. I mean, so so these were people who I think in some ways maybe kind of tended to think outside the box a little bit. Uh, also, Texas wasn't quite as enthralled to the to the what C. Van Woodward called the burden of Southern history, right? The the even though Texas had was settled mostly by Southerners and had certainly done its part for the Confederate cause in the late unpleasantness, Texans had their own they had their own history, right? That they could look that they could look at that they had they had the history of the Texas Revolution and the the and 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 the republic you know their experience as an independent republic and and again, the, the frontier experience much fresher in their minds, and so I think that that they they weren't quite as they weren't quite as defensive after the Civil War about feeling that they had to defend the Democratic Party, which had been the party of the fathers, the party of secession, the party of slavery, the party of the Old South, the party of the Confederacy, and I think all of those things may have had something of a liberating effect upon the thinking of, uh, of Texans. Um, let me pick up on something that you just said to, to ask this next question. Um, although I'm tempted to note that this next question also has a Orwellian feel to it mm -hmm. uh, in the sense that we all know that whoever controls the past controls the present and the future. Uh, ben Wright uh, has written the following question, uh, which I, a lot of people like and I do too, uh, which is he'd like to know how Texas populace understood and wielded American history. Uh, we've heard Andrew Jackson and Thomas Jefferson described as populists. Did Texas populists claim their mantle? And relatedly, did they invoke others like the regulators, local focos, or readjusters? Yeah. Uh, what was their deployment? Uh, these are my words now. What was their deployment of history and, and, and how consciously so? Yeah, it's very interesting. Um, populists constantly invoked uh, Jackson and Jefferson and Jackson, and they they claim to be the true heirs of Jeffersonian and Jacksonian democracy, um, and and argued, of course, that that the the dominant party in Texas, the the the, the Democrats, had it, it, by the 1890s had re, had really repudiated, had betrayed the the uh, the, uh, the 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 spirit and 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 ideology of Jeffersonian and Jacksonian democracy. And this was only true, this was only true in some limited ways, I think. Uh, you know, they spoke that that language of small r republicanism, or what some historians call artisanal republicanism. You mentioned the, the local focos, right? The Jack Jacksonian working men. That, that was the only vocabulary that they really had to draw upon. So they took those elements of Jacksonian and Jeffersonian democracy as they understood them, um, wh which were sort of small p populist in some ways in, in terms of uh, making appeals to ordinary men and, and being anti-elitist, right? Mm -hmm. so certainly Jacksonian democracy is very anti-elitist. Uh, but of course, it, the the program that they worked out this this activist government program that really has much more in common with 20th century liberalism than it does with Jacksonian democracy of the 1820s or 30s it it was a real stretch to say that even though they 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 swore to their deathbeds that that, that Jackson and Jefferson were their political heroes and, and inspiration 
it was very hard for them to square that. And they, they, they did a lot of sort of mental gymnastics trying to prove that, that, that J Jackson would have uh, approved of the sub treasury plan and that, that sort of stuff. Well, you know, I think that honestly, we in 2020 are not unfamiliar with parties doing mental gymnastics to try to yeah. fit their current. Yeah. Current and another interesting that. thing, they also, they also said many kind things about Abraham Lincoln. Uh, which again took some, you know, it took some nerve in Texas in the 1890s when the the big bulk of their constituents were former Confederates. So, so let me go really big picture on you here, because one of the points that I try to make to my students uh, is to show them an electoral map of 1896, and to basically say, "This is it. This is the electoral map you're going to get until the Great Depression." except for that one moment where the Republicans really screwed up and split their party in 1912. Right. Uh, talk to me about if the populace had done things differently in 1896, would there have been a, a faster change? I mean, you, you mentioned their disappointment in some ways with having backed Brian in the way that the Democrats did. Is there, is there a moment here that to really have recreated a different electoral map if they had done something different at the beginning of this electoral period? Well, it's of course historians are always leery of the of the counterfactual argument, right? Oh, I'm not. They're saying, oh, they're saying that what might have happened, right? Well, it didn't happen. Um, the, you know, the, in any third party uh, is up against in the United States because of our the way our constitutions were written. Any third party faces a terrible uphill battle. Uh, because as I, as I mentioned earlier, ultimately to be successful as a third party, you need to knock off one of the other parties, right? And so, so if the populist had followed the desperate pleadings of the Texas delegation at the 1896 populist national convention and had not endorsed the Democrat Brian, if they had maintained their their uh, party existence as an independent entity and had another shot at it in four years, uh, would they have had a chance? Maybe, I mean, people were, people were very, I mean, they, people forget that the, 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 the uh, depression of the, the mid 1890s, which had been an agricultural depression for two decades before that, it was the worst depression in American history up until that time and would be the worst until the Great Depression of the 30s. People were in, I mean, people were starving. Unemployment was rampant. And if the, if the, if the Democrats had continued as a, conser a, 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 a very conservative party, hostile to agricultural interests and hostile to labor interests, um, not a whole lot different than the Republicans. Of course, that's what the populists always said, that they're Tweedledee and Tweedledum, the Democrats and Republicans. Um, we, you know, we're, we're the real alternative. Maybe, maybe things work out differently, but we'll never know, of course. Yeah, it raises interesting questions, I think, about whether one, uh, as an insurgent movement, should work within a party or outside. outside right, oh, yeah. In some ways. Uh, so let me go back to our, our list of questions because there's a whole number of people who like this question from Kyle uh, Wilkinson. Uh, and I think it's very specific to your presentation tonight. Um, at the Alliance's critical exchange moment in Dallas, why did the bankers deny the Alliance credit? Uh, was it strictly business prospects or was there politics mixed, mingled in as well? Well, historians you know, have debated this question a good bit and uh, that certainly the business people, the uh, uh, bankers and, and cotton factories, so forth, who, 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 you know, in the end refused to do business with the uh, with the Alliance Exchange. Certainly, they they claimed that it was just it was just a business decision that the that the, the Alliance was was counting on being able to use the the pledged crops uh, of Texas cotton farmers as their collateral for 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 the loans that they needed, 
And of course, a, a crop that hadn't even been harvested yet is pretty risky collateral, right? Uh, on the other hand, those bankers and, 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 and cotton merchants and so forth, that, they understood what a threat the Alliance Cooperative Program was uh, mm -hmm. to their own financial well-being. So, you know, if you are sort of tend to be conspiracy minded, you say, oh, the evil cabal of, of bankers and financiers, you know, pulled the plug on the Farmers Alliance. It's probably some messy, complicated mix of both explanations. So uh, let me bring you back, if you will, to where you began your presentation, which was um, with a health, healthy series of definitions trying to help us understand the term, what exactly it means. I mean, as you point out, when we have Mitt Romney and uh, uh, Bernie Sanders called the same thing, clearly yeah. something's going on that's loaded within this phrase. Yeah, not, and, not very many people ever accuse Mitt Romney of being a populist, but that... That's a fair point. Um, I think... Uh, I think he would have liked it, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He could have used a little populism. Yeah. Uh, so uh, there seems to be an association, and this was asked by one of our, our uh, attendees, an association between the term populist and demagogue in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, I was just, can you speak to that? Because it's, it's striking that I think about people who become mm -hmm. leftist leaders and or demagogic leaders they don't necessarily come from any particular place within societal spectrum. I and mean, we can think of well-to-do uh, demagogues and rather poor demagogues. Right. Uh, so what is it about this term you think that has intertwined, intertwined itself with populism? Well, of course that, the short, the, the short one word definition of modern populism in most people's minds is, is in fact demagoguery, right? Mm -hmm. That this, it's, it's making cynical appeals to the, again, the sort of fears and prejudices of the, of the masses of the voting, of the voting public in, in a cynical ploy for votes and, and political power, right? I mean, that's, that's what most people associate populism with. Uh, populism doesn't have to be that way, though, right? Populism as a political style can cannot be cynical. It cannot be demagogic. It can simply be doing those things that I talked about, appealing to the common voter, uh, criticizing elites in Washington. I mean... You're a politician in America, and you and you run against corruption. You 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 campaign on the promise, let's say, to drain the swamp in Washington. That's not necessarily a demagogic appeal, right? I mean, we probably all would agree that there is some swamp draining needs to be need, needs to be done in Washington, right, and other political capitals. Well, let me, the, the question is, do you really, is that really what you, you, you plan to do? Or are you just saying that to get elected? And that's, that, that's where populism really runs into trouble, right? Because so many people, so many political figures making those demagogic appeals don't really intend to do anything about it. Wait, but let, let me push back on that for an instance, right. one historian to another, because I actually think I would have reversed the answer that I would suggest that what you described is demagoguery mm -hmm. that using a cynical appeal to rile up passions for one's own uh, accumulation of power, I would separate from populism. I mean, when I think about a populist who was also a demagogue, mm -hmm. um, but maybe less demagogue, now let me just stick, I think of a populist. First one that always comes to mind for me is Huey Long. Right. Uh, I have no reason to think that he wasn't sincere about his interest in helping the people. I think he was also interested in, you know, doing well for himself too. I mean, the people can do well and I can do well. Mm -hmm. uh, are, it would not be uh, difficult for Huey Long to argue. Uh, but I think that there was a sincerity to what he's arguing. Whereas I would think a demagogue would be one for whom sincerity is lacking. So I would say, you know, Long is a good populist uh, in that sense. I, I think you certainly make that argument about Long. Uh, there are plenty of you read. I imagine if you read a good selection of U.S. history textbooks, you will see Long portrayed as at least 
something of a demagogue, as well as at times being very being uh, being very sincere. Long is a really complicated figure, as yeah. I'm sure you and and many of our many of our participants today uh, understand. Uh, again, I think it a, a lot of it a lot of it gets down to the, these public the, again the public perception of just of this almost knee jerk reaction to to the to, to hearing the word populist. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was listening to the radio this afternoon, and they were talking about the new uh, the uh, New York Times uh, Michael Schmidt, the New York New York Times uh, columnist uh, uh, reporter's new book on on Don McGahn, the the former uh, Trump uh, um, uh, uh, general count uh, yeah, White House counsel, and and the the uh, radio host just sort of out of the blues, you know, said, hey, McGann, McGann was a, a true Trump believer. He was a true populist. Well, I, you know, I think they probably, he, he meant that sincerely, right? He, he meant that McGann was a, was a sincere populist, whatever that meant. But the, the word's gotten used and abused so much now that I, I think, I think we have to make our peace. I, I know that I know that I, as a sort of member of the small band of populist historians around the country, uh, I know that we all have fought this battle to try to reclaim the P word, uh, you know, uh, uh, from from its modern usage. But we probably that's probably a project we need to give up on. Well, and it, it, strikes, <laughs> yeah, it strikes me as very similar to another. Yeah, and modern. and you know, you'll hear people you'll hear people who are fans of a given populist political figure, Donald Trump's fans, Bernie Sanders fans, and you will often hear them say, hey, that's good populism. That, you know, populism's a good thing, right? So a lot of it is in the eye of the beholder. Yeah, I think sincerity is really what, how one would make that, that distinction. In fact, I'm, I'm thinking of another P word that I think needs to be reclaimed and rethought in some ways, which is progressive. Yeah, um, yeah I knew you were going, I knew where you were going there. Yeah, and, I mean, uh, you know, these... right. And, and uh, of course, you know, I had to think, I had to think long and hard about putting the L word in the title of my book and, and making it a kind of a central theme. Um, because, you know, the, the opponents of liberalism in the United States since the 1980s have been wildly successful uh, at uh, at sort of tarnishing that that term, I think without maybe without really understanding uh, uh, what it really has historically meant. Well, actually, I mean, could you say a little bit more about that? Because that's actually one of the questions that um, Bill Bush had, and several people were curious about. So, as you wrestled yourself with using the L word, right. liberal liberalism, in in the title of your book. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously, um, populism gets associated with reactionary politics, not with liberalism. Um, walk us through as a historian, as you're thinking about how to weigh your un historical understanding of these terms versus, if you will, the current market understanding of these terms. Um, help us understand how, how you weigh that decision and, and how you, um, you know, honestly, what vocabulary you choose to use yeah. for a modern audience. Well, um, I spent, I, I worked on this book more years than I care to admit. Um, and th this was not where I thought I was going to end up uh, back when I started my odyssey uh, in, into populism. Um, I, the, the historians of populism, really of the, my, my generation, you know, that I, that I grew up reading, uh, particularly the uh, the historian Lawrence Goodwin mm -hmm. uh, had had really portrayed populism as something very different than liberalism. They they rescued it from those who had said it was reactionary mm -hmm. that generation in the 1950s, let's say. But 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 that generation in really in the 1960s. 60s and 70s uh, that were part of the so-called new left movement in academia. They tended to portray populism as a sort of radical alternative to the course of American liberal capitalism. Mm -hmm. 
and that's that's really what I sort of reached maturity as a historian, believing and assuming I would find uh, in in, uh, in in Texas populism. And I've resisted it for a long time. And, uh, you know, finally the evidence just sort of flogged me over the head. And I said, well, what? I am not seeing these populists as alternatives to liberal capitalism. I'm seeing them as progenitors of it, right? As, as sort of, in some ways, the, some, the, the inventors of it in some ways, right? And so then I had to do a lot of reading in the, in the very broad and complicated literature about liberalism, something that historian, a lot of historians who have studied a lot of political history have not really delved into a lot of this, uh, a lot of this uh, scholarly literature. So I, you know, I read oh, people like the historian uh, Alan Ryan from Oxford and people like this. Uh, and, and what I found is that, that you know, historians have struggled to even define what modern liberalism is. And a lot of people have portrayed it as this sort of a patched together compromise between socialism and, uh, and, and, and capitalism that's not really very, very good about either of them, right? But, the, but what, I, what I began to learn as I, I read more about it was that, that liberalism really is, modern 20th, 20th and 21st century liberalism really is its own ideology. It really is with, with its own set of, you know, you know with, with its own set of sort of guiding principles. And a lot of people, I think, don't really understand that. They, a lot of people, again, think it's just take a little socialism here and a little free market capitalism there and throw them together and see what sticks, right? But in fact, if you think about modern liberalism as, as this idea that, that certain public problem, widely shared public problems, require public solutions, right? Uh, that that, that the, the, the sort of, let's say, fair, classical liberalism, when I say classical liberalism, I'm talking about the liberalism of Adam Smith and the 18th century, um, that sort of libertarianism version of liberalism. Uh, Modern liberals, and, and again, I count populists among their progenitors, they understood that that, that kind of laissez-faire capitalism, laissez-faire liberalism, if you will, uh, was inadequate to meet the exigencies of a modern industrial uh, society. And so, because they saw the power of the of, of the of the giant corporations, the monopolistic power of the giant corporations, which enjoyed uh, special privileges granted to them by the fact that they are corporations, especially limited liability for the stockholders. That they saw that and realized that 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 power was so that power that corporate power had the power to to sort of exploit ordinary people to such a degree that, that it needed a counterbalance. And the counterbalance, the only counterbalance really available once you had tried self-help that didn't work, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, the only really real counterbalance in a, in a modern capitalistic society was to harness the, the democratic power of the government to, to provide this balance so that there wouldn't be exploitative power by corporations or oppressive power by the government that they would they would they would balance one another and so when you start thinking about liberalism in those terms um, it begins to, to look a lot more like a sort of coherent ideology and not just some ramshackle vehicle that evolved by chance so i mean not, not, i don't know how deep in the weeds of you know, political nomenclature we want to get, but I'm, I'm curious, and I'm, I'm thinking about the power of your argument that much of what you're describing as the the roots of populism, especially with their Texas history, I think I would have told a similar story, not being a Texas historian, uh, 
you may not be able to tell from my accent, not even being a Texan, um, but I would have put it in a more urban context and used the word progressive. I mean, is there a sense in which I could simply say, I could read your book and understand the agrarian Western nature of populism and recognize that there's a similar movement going on in the urban, in urban America, which coalesce in the first decades of the 20th century for that kind of reform for the common man that you're referring to? Sure, sure. and I don't, and I certainly, as I said in my, my, my remarks, there is this sort of progression, I think, from populists through the progressives of the 19 aughts and teens and 20s into the New Deal. I think historians are beginning to, are beginning to realize that our neat compartmentalization of populism, progressivism, the New Deal is probably oversimplified. Uh, and I don't for a minute uh, doubt or deny that in, in the cities uh, about starting about the same time and continuing into the progressive era proper, that there were a lot, of, there was a lot of the same sort of reformist spirit. Now, where I think, where I think uh, you have to be careful is that unlike populism, progressivism was sort of self-consciously elitist, yes. right? <laughs> I mean, progressivism, certain, and it's certainly true in the South, right? In, in the South, progressivism, in the, in the words of the famous Southern historian C. Van Woodward, progressivism was, was, for, was progressivism for whites only, right? Because after the defeat of populism, blacks are disfranchised uh, and the structures of Jim Crow are, are constructed. And so, and, and in the process, millions of poor white men are also disfranchised and, and, and eliminated from the political prospect, uh, political uh, equation uh, by means of, of uh, poll taxes, particularly. So uh, the, those parts of populism, and, I've, and again, I've talked only a, a little bit, and it's a complicated subject, I've talked only a little bit about their outreach to, to women and minorities, especially racial minorities, ethnic minorities. But that part of populism, and, and again, it's a complicated legacy, and they were not 21st century liberals on race by any stretch. But that part of the populist, certainly the Texas populist legacy, stands in pretty sharp contrast to what you see among urban progressives. Um, so I'm, I'm hesitant to ask this next question because I, I feel like it may cause some sort of uh, internal fight. But I think, if I'm not mistaken, Aaron Navarro is one of your colleagues now at, at TCU. Is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. Okay, well, he's got a question. So if you don't like it, you know, you can take it out on the next faculty. Uh, okay, well, we'll see. Uh, he says, he asks, uh, was the regional nature of the People's Party a factor in its collapse after the endorsement of William J. Bryant? Uh, why couldn't the People's Party rebound after all they've been through? Well, it, 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 it's a, it is actually I will give I will give my colleague Professor Navarro uh, credit for asking a good question. <laughs> um, so, uh, social scientists, particularly particularly uh, sociologists, have really studied this question a good bit. And one of the more convincing explanations is that populism, while it was a it was a political party, it was also a social movement, right? And, and, and social movements sort of have this, a social movement sort of originating with really in the Farmers Alliance and to some extent in, in the Knights of Labor. And as a so, and social movements have their own dynamics, right? And social movements uh, rely upon a sort of us against them mentality and, a, and they develop a, a, a strong sense of, of sort of esprit de corps among members, and they can they can they can withstand defeats and disappointments as long as they think that their movement is still viable, and that the leaders of the movement. There's a whole 
body of literature about the leadership of, of social movements, as long as they think the leaders of the movement continue to have the best interests of the movement at mm -hmm. heart. Mm -hmm. And so when the populists in 1896 fused with the, the Democrats uh, over William, the William, William Jennings Bryan uh, candidacy, it was a terribly demoralizing event for populists who, who, who I think with good reason thought that their, their leaders had sold them down the river. Uh, now, also important to, to speak to the regional part of, of, of Aaron's question. You got, it's also important to remember that populists in many states had already practiced uh, fusion deals with one or the other of the major parties in their state at the state level. Uh, and, you know, any time that this term fusion is more of a, a 19th century term, but it really means joining together in a political coalition between two or more parties, right? They called that fusion. It was very common in the 19th century. And the problem with fusion, let's say you're the state of North Carolina, for example, had a strong populist movement, couldn't win elections on its own, still had a fairly strong Republican party. They couldn't win elections on their own. So the Republicans and the populists in that state joined forces, divided up the part, divided up the offices between populists and Republicans, ran a joint ticket and won and carried the state mm -hmm. in 1894 and ruled the state with this weird cobbled together coalition of Republicans and populists. Uh, and then you know, electorally, they were pretty successful. But of course, that comes at a real risk to the movement part of your, of your party. Right? The true believers are likely to look at that and say, no, this is, a, this is a sacrifice of principle. Republicans don't believe the same thing as Democrats. I mean, as populists. Or in other states, uh, where the Republicans were the, Kansas, for example, where Republicans are the dominant power, Democrats cut deals, fusion deals with, with uh, populists and Democrats cut fusion deals. And, and in every case, populist voters feel betrayed, but they could still kind of hold it together as long as there was this hope for national success. And when they perceived that their national leaders had betrayed the principles of the movement. It was just too much. Mm. And in the word, it, to, to use the lingo of the, of the sociologist, rapid demobilization took place in the movement. Uh, we're gonna have to rapidly demobile, demobilize ourselves in just a minute. Um, I wanna ask one more question then I'm gonna turn it back to Professor Grayville for some concluding thoughts. Uh, and, and this is a question that has been circling through my mind. So I'm glad that uh, Guy Chet put a, really a better way of describing it than I had. Uh, and it's, he writes, uh, it sounds like populism as a persuasion or mode of communication channeled grassroots Christian ethics. Uh, was the tension between populists and conventional political parties also a tension between grassroots Christianity and established churches? And, and I think that's a remarkably good, and I'll, I'm adding, that's a, I think it's a remarkably good question because I, clearly uh, the populist movement has some, uh, shall we say, some tenets that one might think Jesus would have supported. Uh, and that's not always the case with populists or demagogues. So I'm, I'm curious if you, if how you want to respond to the, the tension perhaps of a religious nature here. Well, it just so happens that the first chapter of this book that I wrote some number of years ago was the uh, was the chapter on populists and religion, and and uh, Professor Chet is correct in 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 suggesting that there was a very strong dimension, a religious dimension in populism. It's very interesting, and, and it does come out of the sort of s s rural and particularly southern evangelical tradition, which goes, of course, all the way back into the, into the colonial period, right? Um, populism, you know, I, I, I sort of emphasized the free thinkers and the Swedenborgians and such in my brief comments, but of course, the, the vast rank uh, and file of populists in Texas and elsewhere 
were, were evangelical Protestants. But it's very interesting that in Texas and, in, and I think in, in, in many other states, followers of what, what we would call restorationist denominations were, were, were uh, particularly prominent and really overrepresented. Re when I talk about restorationist de denominations, I'm talking about the Disciples of Christ, the Primitive Baptists, and, and some others. Uh, in Texas, uh, Disciples of Christ, which are a relative, compared to Baptists and Methodists, are a relatively small denomination. They were populist. It was amazing how many populists were disciples of Christ. Uh, and restorationists who come out of the, the Stone Campbell uh, movement of the early 19th century, they, they believed that modern religion had become corrupt and materialistic. They often referred to the main, mainline denominations as churchianity, not Christianity. And, and so populists and, 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 and rural evangelicalism and particularly the restorationist denominations uh, had a tradition, a sort of countercultural tradition. Again, it goes all the way back to the late colonial period. Uh, women and men were viewed as more equal in the eyes of God. Uh, women had had uh, more important roles to play in church life than they did in many of the, mm, I guess, more liturgical uh, denominations. Um, urban religion came in for a lot of criticism from populists who complained about about elaborate church buildings and stained glass and expensive pipe organs and these things, you know. And, and so, yes, it's certainly true that populists, uh, in addition to drawing upon some of the language of Jacksonian and Jeffersonian republicanism, small r republicanism, they also drew, I think, in probably in equal parts from the sort of countercultural traditions of evangelical Protestantism and particularly of the restorationist sects. Um, and we see that in the way they campaigned. The camp meeting, the summer camp meeting, was the, the, probably the single most important campaigning device that populists used. And they borrowed it in whole cloth from the religious camp meetings uh, of the 19th century South. That's fascinating. That's fascinating. Um, this has been a wonderful conversation. Uh, I've, I've learned a lot. I'm going to turn it over to, to Professor Graybill in just a second. Um, Greg, I want to thank you on behalf of the Center for Presidential History. Uh, and before we leave, I want to remind everyone who uh, joins the Center for Presidential History's events of our next event, uh, which is September 16th, when my friend Julian Zelzer from Princeton University will be discussing his new book, which not coincidentally, I think, has populist streaks and demagogic streaks. Uh, it's a book about Newt Gingrich. Uh, it's called Burning Down the House. And it's a really fascinating discussion of the rise of uh, Gingrich and the contract of America in the uh, 80s and early 90s. And I encourage you on the 16th to tune in for that. He's always a, a great, great speaker and a great, a great talk. So without further ado, Greg, my thanks to you. And Professor Grable, thank you for ending things up for us. Thanks, Jeff. I've enjoyed it. Oh, it was great. It was really wonderful. Thanks, Jeff and Greg, for you know an incredibly stimulating conversation on a historical subject, but one with uh, with really profound contemporary salience. Normally, we would uh, sort of usher folks outside into the rotunda in Dallas Hall. We would have a book signing, alas. Um, but let me urge you to buy Greg's book, which is a terrific read. Really, one of the things that I think uh, many of us appreciate about Greg as a historian is what a wonderful prose stylist he is. Straight up, but especially for a scholar. Uh, so it's good reading to keep you busy over the next several weeks before the election. Thanks again for coming out tonight. And uh, I am sure that uh, you all will be sort of anxiously awaiting the next event uh, in the CPH fall schedule. So goodbye and good night. <laughs>